Hello everyone, my name is Dan Thomas. I'm a consultant geriatrician based in Liverpool. I was going to do my talk on World Delirium Awareness Day on the topic of COVID-19 and delirium. And based on my experience working on the, I guess, the, the front line of COVID-19 over the last 12 months. Um, so what I'll be doing is looking at the challenges of looking after people who have COVID and who have delirium. Um, and this isn't going to be a talk on my thoughts or speculations on the, on the pathophysiology of delirium or of COVID delirium. There's, there's far better people who are more qualified than that to talk on that topic. Um, a bit of background about myself. So I'm a consultant in a large teaching hospital in the northwest of England. Um, and the, the area we, we cover has high rates of socioeconomic deprivation, um, high rates of frailty, high rates of chronic diseases and, and, and multimorbidity. And we've been hit quite hard by three waves of COVID-19 over the last 12 months, starting uh, initially sort of March to May. Then again in, in autumn, October through to November, and then we're just coming off the back of our third wave of COVID at the moment. Um, and I, throughout the last 12 months, I've more or less been working on the, the COVID wards during that time. We also had significant outbreaks in our surrounding care homes. Um, so the challenges that I found were, were recognition of, of COVID, particularly during the first wave, and then recognition of delirium in people who've got COVID and recognition of COVID in people who have delirium, the challenges of establishing the prior baseline. And I'll talk a little bit about that and why I think the baseline of people's baseline cognition is worse than, than normal. Um, the, the problem of attrib attribution bias. So uh, thinking that people are delirious just because of COVID. Um, the difficulty which which we've had in particular with differentiating between someone who's dying from COVID and someone who's got a hypoactive delirium because of COVID, uh, the high rates of NG feeding that we've been using, and also looking at the recovery from COVID uh, and that slow recovery of, of going back to um, previous cognitive and functional baseline if, if they ever reach that baseline again. Um, I think the first thing to speak about was in, in wave one, delirium not being recognised in people who've got COVID, which, which isn't surprising because we know there's plenty of evidence of delirium not being identified in people when they're in hospital, no matter what illness they come in with. But I think a particular issue with COVID was a lack of recognition of delirium as a presenting feature, particularly during the first wave when testing for COVID was limited and when we were only testing for COVID with people presenting with um cough and or a fever and obviously older frailer people don't mount that inflammatory response often don't present with those symptoms um, and particularly prior to there being uh, the evidence to show that people were present with delirium as a sole presenting feature our experience on working in the hospitals that, that the geriatricians were getting concerned that people who were presenting with delirium and I can remember having to justify my reasons for listing someone to the COVID ward uh, when they weren't presenting with a with a fever or a cough but they were older and confused and they had sort of a high CRP and, and, and lymphopenia and I think that lack of recognition would probably have driven some some hospital spread of uh, nosocomial COVID in the UK too um, it was also difficult because it was hard to establish people's true cognitive baseline. Um, I mean, some people haven't haven't seen their family or or friends for months. So again, how do you how do you decide that it's delirium? How do you decide that the that deterioration in cognition is is acute when you've got nothing to to measure it measure it against? Um, and then. When you were establishing people's baseline, the baseline of people that we've seen is so much worse than it was previously um, because of things such as lack of social stimulation, lack of interaction with, with their friends and family. You know, when, when I'm assessing people for frail on, on the frailty unit or in any a, a question that I like to ask is, when was the last time you left the house not counting, having to go on to see the doctors or GPs or to go to healthcare appointments? But that becomes a, a useless question in lockdown times when, when no one's leaving the house. 
And then as a result of people not leaving the house and going for walks, going to exercise groups, going to, to rehab, people are more deconditioned, more sarcopenic. And on top of that, I think people were, were medically worse when we saw them. So by that, I mean, people weren't being diagnosed with underlying medical problems because of a, a, a lack of access to um, primary and, 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 and secondary care, though I must emphasize, you know, GPs were still seeing patients. Um, people's chronic disease was generally managed a little bit worse as well because of the same reasons. And then, you know, medications reviewed, reviews again, weren't necessarily happening. Um, and maybe, you know, as a result of, you know, lack of social stimulation and lack of lack of interaction, people were, were drinking slightly more too. But again, I emphasize these are all just my anecdotal experiences of, of why I think people uh, were more prone to, to get in delirium when they came into hospital. Um, and then on top of that, if you've got to design a deliriogenic environment, then, then hospitals during COVID times is, is the perfect storm. People were having multiple moves through multiple wards, multiple bays within wards, multiple zones within the hospital, with hospital bays, wards and areas flipping between non-COVID, COVID, COVID triage areas on a, on a daily basis. So it wasn't uncommon to come across older, frailer people who'd had, you know, 10, 20 moves. So on top of the, the, the change in environment, they're also seeing multiple different teams. So they were coming across people who they'd not met before, but also every time that a new team of healthcare professionals was interacting with them, you know, the entire history taken, et cetera, would, would start from scratch again. You know, there's a lack of visitors. So having no friends or families to help with orientation is predisposing people to delirium. The PPE that we're all wearing makes communication very difficult. And you know, if you've got hearing impairment, visual impairment, cognitive impairment, hospitals are a disorientated environment at the best of times without, you know, having people where you can't see the faces, you can't lip read, you can't understand what they're saying. I also wonder whether our liberal use of steroids during sort of our second and third waves when we have the evidence from the recovery trial showing that steroids uh, it dramatically improve survival and people with COVID may have contributed to um, to predisposing people to, to, to delirium with them um, not necessarily just steroid psychosis but you know with, with keeping you awake at night that lack of sleep uh, sleep day cycle and of course uh, the other thing stopping you um, sleep at night in hospital during COVID times was there's so many sick people in co with COVID that you've got multiple medical emergency team visits to the ward, multiple observations overnight. So you've got the whole diurnal variation contributing to the delirium as well. I remember sort of early on during, during the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of speculation about whether we would be having to use the risk benefit of using sedatives in delirium or to, to treat severe agitation in delirium would would flip slightly towards benefit if you had people walking around the wards you know who could potentially spread covid to other patients and to other staff in, in my experience we weren't using them any more than we would normally use them which is to say not that much at all and that may just be because we were on a completely covid ward that you were less worried about you know everyone had covid so you weren't worried about someone walking around and spreading covid to another patient because all the patients had covid and but certainly in my experience we, we weren't using any more antipsychotics or or sedatives for agitation and delirium than we would do normally um and something else i've become increasingly concerned about was some um, attribution bias so you know everyone's delirium being labelled solely due to COVID and you've got that search satisfaction error, you, you've got someone, you don't know why they're delirious, and then you notice they've got COVID and then it quickly becomes a COVID delirium. And, and I do slightly worry that COVID was becoming sort of the new, the, the new UTI. So, so by that, I mean, there was a lot of delirium or being attributed to delirium, being attributed to COVID um, when, you know, there were surely plenty of other con contributing causes 
and I think the same with any other cause of delirium you know if you're only finding one cause you're not looking hard enough and I think you know that that applies to COVID-19 too. Something that we were using much more of was NG feeding to bridge people who had a previously good swallow but had now um, had a dramatically reduced appetite or reduced ability to swallow. I mean, clearly that's dependent on the someone's sort of cognitive and and uh, cognitive trajectory and the, you know, the trajectory of the of the, the swallowing baseline. But we were certainly seeing a lot more feeding and feeding problems and appetite problems than than I've seen before. Um, and, and maybe that's because of you know that loss of taste and smell and loss of appetite that people get with COVID r- rather than just rather than just the delirium. I mean, certainly anecdotes from the patients I was seeing with this on the ward seem to have in, in, impressive results and NG feeding to bridge them, to bridge the nutrition seem to work, but you know, I'm not a big believer in, in anecdotes and there may be plenty of examples other people have where this was inappropriate or, or didn't work. And clearly NG feeding in the context of someone with delirium comes with harm if that person's trying to remove the NG because you've, you, know, you may need to bridle the NG, you may need to uh, have people wearing mittens so they don't pull out the NG. So it's not a, it doesn't come without harms, but certainly we, it was something we seem to be using more, more than we do normally. Um, I was seeing much more hypo, active delirium in the in the people I was looking after with COVID and we were often and still are often in a bit of a dilemma about whether someone is dying from COVID or whether they've just got a severe hypoactive delirium and and often only only time would tell and certainly uh, I think people seem to have taken a longer time to recover to their previous cognitive and, and functional baselines um, from sort of delirium with COVID-19 than with other deliriums that I've seen, but that is just pure speculation on on, on my behalf. I, I don't know whether the evidence base or if there is an evidence base to suggest that is, is the case. I mean, our patients certainly have significant rehabilitation needs. Um, and on top of that, because of the nature of the pandemic, you've got uh, sort of people in hospital for much longer than they need to be in hospital and um, so due to isolation rules you know people couldn't necessarily go back to the care home if there was a covid outbreak or care packages wouldn't wouldn't support people if they had covid um, so you know people were staying in that deliriogenic environment for much longer than they would need to which isn't helping their delirium um, something else that I guess has been playing on my mind, particularly since in, in wave one, was we weren't recruiting that many older people to the recovery trial. Um, we, we've got much better at that, but I think it, that does play on my mind. I think we, we know with COVID you have worse outcomes the older you are. We also know that COVID delirium is, is, is very common. So if, you've, if you're older, you will present with delirium. Yeah, I'm not sure how well these people are being represented in 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 COVID trials, um, particularly when there's there's issues around consenting people with delirium to 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 trials. Um, so that's something that that does concern me. But I think we've we've become much better at the, better at that, and we've managed to recruit quite a lot of older people with with cognitive problems to 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 recovery um, in the in the latter two waves. Um, so just moving on to my worries now. My, my worries now is, you know, what uh, is people, is are old people with COVID-19 delirium, is their cognition going to improve? Will COVID delirium have worse outcomes to, to other deliriums? Um, that's a worry because we're, we're discharging people back to that same lockdown environment. So, you know, we know that people with delirium do better in their own environment, but this isn't really their own environment. Going back home, and not being able to see your friends or family, you know, that's not normal. So I worry about that. I also worry about the the what follow up are we offering these these people who've who've had COVID and 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 delirium and you know 
where who, how do we choose who we follow up and 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 where do we follow them up um i believe that shibri raman is looking at doing some 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 research into into delirium outcomes of delirium follow-up in people with covid so it'll be interesting to see what what he finds and um, so that's my overview i guess of the sort of frontline experience of, of looking after people with with delirium and and covid um and if, if you want to contact me with 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 any comments my my, my twitter handle is at the at the beginning of the presentation it's at, at dan 26 wales but i hope you found that that helpful thank you